for his courtesy in allowing me to, to uh, precede him in these comments. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President. Senator from Wyoming is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I come to the floor today as I do week after week and have since the uh, health care uh, bill was signed into law with a, a doctor's second opinion about the, the health care law. I do that as someone who practiced medicine, taking care of families all around Wyoming for uh, about a quarter of a century. Uh, and uh, continue to hear great concerns from folks back home and across the country about the, the health care law. And so often people ask the question, does the president really understand uh, the health care law? Well, Mr. President, last week, President Obama, I think, really shocked a lot of Americans. When, when he made a statement, he was not on the teleprompter, he was off script. What he said was that the private sector, he said, was doing fine. He said the private sector was doing fine. And he said that weaknesses in, state, in, the, uh, in our economy uh, had to do with a state and local government. Well, the words made it very clear to people all around the country that the president really was not in touch with what's happening in this country, uh, and specifically with the economy. But then on Monday, President Obama said something else, uh, and it was about the health care law, uh, that made it once again look as though he really doesn't understand what's happening all across America. During an interview the, the president was doing with a, with a local news reporter from, uh, from uh, Sioux City, Iowa, the president actually was surprised to learn that his health care law is hurting small businesses, certainly hurting small businesses all across the country. He was surprised to learn of that. Uh, while the news doesn't come as a shock to most Americans, uh, it definitely caught President Obama off guard. Uh, here's what happened. Uh, the Iowa reporter told the president that uh, one business uh, in Iowa needed to close shop, uh, move their jobs back to Wisconsin because of the president's health care law. The president's response to the reporter uh, I found troubling. President Obama said, yeah, that'd be kind of hard to explain, he said, because the only folks the president said that have been impacted in terms of the health care law, the health care bill, he said, are insurance companies. So let me repeat, the president said that the only folks, the only folks that have been impacted in terms of the health care bill are insurance companies. I mean, that, Mr. President, is why I continue to come to the floor with the doctor's second opinion. Week after week, ever since Nancy Pelosi made that uh, famous statement that first you have to pass it before you get to find out what's in it. I would hope by now, Mr. President, that President Obama would actually know what is in the health care law. But by his statements to this reporter um, in, in Iowa, it certainly seems to me that the president does not know what's in the health care law, does not know how it is impacting jobs and the economy of, uh, in the United States. How on earth can President Obama really believe that insurance companies are the only people impacted by the health care law? And small businesses all across the country are being slammed by the law's expensive mandates, the mandates that people have to have a, uh, a government-approved insurance, often much more expensive than what they've had before, that the insurance premiums that he promised would drop by $2,500 per family have actually gone up higher and faster than if the the law had never been passed in the first place. The president who said, if you like what you have, you can keep it. Now we know millions and millions of Americans who, uh, who had insurance that they liked aren't able to keep it. The fact that colleges, as I talked about last week, colleges across the country are dropping uh, their insurance plans for students uh, because under the president's law, those insurance plans were going to go up anywhere from four to ten times uh, more expensive as a result of the mandates that those students buy government approved levels of insurance which was a lot more insurance than the students needed, wanted, or could afford. So the college is saying we just can't pass this expense on to students so we're going to drop it entirely. So it is astonishing that the president doesn't realize how many people are impacted in a bad way by his own health care law. He thinks only the insurance companies but small business owners are forced now, because of this law, to choose between bad choices. 
One is they can offer just very high cost government approved insurance, making it much more expensive for them to try to run their business and hire workers in this time of uh, a significant uncertainty in the economy. Or number two, um, they won't offer any health coverage at all because they can't afford the health care laws out of touch and expensive insurance mandates. The choice is completely unacceptable and the president really should know that. You know, someone in the White House ought to be informing the president. They ought to clearly be leveling with the president about the impact of his bill, his law, and his understanding of it, and what the impacts of that are on uh, American families and on the American economy. Mr. President, the private, private sector is not doing fine, and this health care law negatively impacts people across the country, including many, many small business owners. The president also deserves to know from his advisors that his health care law is having a significant impact on American seniors. Earlier this week, Senator Coburn and I joined the rest of the uh, Republican health care providers in Congress, in the House, in the Senate, and we released a doctor's note on Medicare. Uh, this new report details how the president's health care law specifically makes it harder for America's seniors, America's seniors, to get the care they need from a doctor that they choose at a lower price. Now, now I'd like to walk through this report. Uh, there is a section called 10 Facts Seniors Need to Know About Medicare's Future. And, and I'll just focus on, on, on five of those. Um, number one, uh, to control Medicare spending, instead of trusting seniors, the president empowered 15 unelected bureaucrats. That's right, the president set up something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board, people who will be politically appointed, not elected, not elected by the voters, unelected bureaucrats, and they will be the ones in charge of deciding and controlling Medicare spending. Here's another. Doctors overwhelmingly believe that the Independent Payment Advisory Board will hurt seniors' access to care. This is under the facts that seniors need to know about Medicare's future as a result of the president's health care law. In a recent survey, 80% of doctors, 80% of doctors said that this independent payment advisory board, the one that the president likes and put in his health care law, it will cut reimbursement rates to doctors which will harm seniors' access to care. 80% of doctors are saying this. Now, let's go to a third. Without congressional action, Medicare reimbursement rates will drop about 30% at the end of the year, which would harm seniors' access to care. That's the law as it stands now. If uh, the law isn't changed, that cut will automatically go into place, and it's going to be that much harder for seniors to get doctors. Seniors are very concerned right now about being able to uh, to find a doctor. If their doctor retires, uh, they have a hard time finding a new doctor. If that senior moves locations, they have a hard time finding a doctor in that location to take care of them. This has been an increasing problem made worse, Mr. President, by the President's health care law. And I think that the President of the United States deserves to hear that and to know that and to realize the impact that his law has had on people way beyond, as he says, just insurance companies. The president also needs to know, because seniors know, that the president's health care law took $530 billion from Medicare, not to save Medicare, not to strengthen Medicare, but to spend on other programs, not for seniors. The health care law cut more than half a trillion dollars from the Medicare program to fund new government programs. Seniors realize this, and it is time that the President of the United States understood the impact of the decisions that he made when he signed into law his health care law. And then many seniors on Medicare Advantage will lose their plan. Uh, more than one in four seniors are currently on Medicare Advantage. It is a choice they make. They know they're on Medicare Advantage. Over 11 million seniors on, on Medicare Advantage. And yet the cuts put, all, put forth in the health care law make it that uh, according to the actuary of Medicare, 
alone said that by 2017, uh, when the Medicare Advantage cuts in the President's health care law are fully implemented, implemented, roughly half, half of the seniors who like the Medicare Advantage plan that they have will lose it. Well, the President said if you like what you have, you can keep it, but perhaps he should have realized that the law that he signed caused him to break a number of the promises uh, that he made to the American people, and that is another one of those broken promises. So the President promises if you like what you have, you can keep it. We find out that many more people are not able to keep what they have. The President said his plan would lower insurance costs by $2,500 per family. We see insurance rates have gone up and are going up faster than if the law had never been passed in the first place. So the reality is, from the time that I've given the, my second opinion last week to now, uh, the President needs to realize that the private sector is not fine and that the President's health care law hurts small businesses, hurts seniors, and hurts patients all across this country. If the President wants to do something to help the private sector, then he should work with Congress to repeal his health care law and to replace it with better reforms that actually would be better for patients and providers and taxpayers. This health care law, as I see, it, it's, it's bad for patients, it's bad for providers, the, the nurses and the doctors who take care of those patients, and it's terrible for the American taxpayers. What we need is health care reform that actually provides for people the care that they need from a doctor that they choose at a lower cost. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Suggest the absence of a quorum. Uh, the clerk call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Senator from Montana is recognized. Mr. President, I ask that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection, and the Senator is recognized. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that two detailees from my office, Herrick Fox and Benjamin Thomas, be granted floor privileges for the remainder of the debate on S3240, the Agriculture Reform, Food, and Jobs Act. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I rise in strong opposition to multiple amendments to the Farm Bill that would undermine critical support for American sugar producers and the American jobs that they create. These amendments would pull the rug off from underneath sugar beet producers in my home state of Montana. They would leave farmers and other sugar industry workers from Montana across the country vulnerable to job loss. In these tough economic times, this is a step backwards in job creation. And that's a step we can't afford to take. Montana is the fifth largest sugar beet producing state in the nation. In 2010, our cash receipts totaled more than $66 million, and those dollars mean good paying American jobs. That's why the Farm Bill continues vital support that helps American sugar producers sustain more than 140,000 jobs and nearly $20 billion in economic activity every year. Our sugar policy is a proven investment in American jobs at no cost to the taxpayer. That's right. Let me repeat that. The United States sugar policy doesn't cost American taxpayers a single cent. So why in the world would we want to get rid of this proven job creator at a time when jobs should be our number one priority? The policy does not restrict access to low sugar prices for manufacturers, but it allows sugar producers from Montana and the rest of the United States to compete in the world market with access to less quality sugar, cheaper labor, and fewer regulations. Other countries very, very strongly protect their sugar industry. Now, some argue that our sugar program, while not costing the American taxpayer directly, costs them indirectly at the grocery store. But let me be very clear. For every $1 candy bar bought at a grocery store, only two cents of that total cost is sugar. For every one dollar, only two cents of that cost of that candy bar is sugar. With no cost to American people and proven benefits extending from rural farmers to the entire economy, this policy works. And it is a lifeline to Montana sugar beet farmers and the rural communities they live in. I won't let us get rid of policies that support proven job creators at a time when we need jobs more than ever. Mr. President, you have the floor and ask, I suggest the absence of the quorum. Uh, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Earlier today, the uh, Senate tabled a couple of amendments to the proposed to the Farm Bill by Senator Shaheen and Paul. They are trying to, off the floor, uh, determine a way forward on the $969 billion Farm Bill. And in the meantime, have been talking about a number of issues, including that Farm Bill. The Senate is the only body in this week. The House is out for the duration of the week for a district work period. So lots of Senate committees meeting this week, including earlier today, the uh, Banking Committee hearing from J.P. Morgan head Jamie Dimon and uh, talking about the, the trading loss at J.P. Morgan. That hearing will air tonight in prime time, 8 o'clock Eastern, on C-SPAN.
Senator from Kansas. I ask the quorum call be lifted. Without objection, the Senator from Kansas is recognized. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, I come to the Senate floor this afternoon to uh, address an issue uh, related to hunger. Uh, a topic that is a significant component of the farm bill that we are debating uh, and particularly to raise the topic uh, associated with an amendment that I have offered. It's an amendment number 2403. Most of us uh, have heard the expression, it's an, it's an old saying that goes like this, uh, give a man a fish and he eats for a day, teach a man to fish and he'll eat for the rest of his life. By teaching someone how to fish or how to grow crops, we help them provide food for themselves and for their families. The bill we're considering has funds set aside for a program called Food for Peace, uh, Title II. They're intended to do just that, to help combat world hunger and malnutrition. We have a long history in Kansas, Senator Dole being a prime example of someone who has cared greatly about hunger, not only in the United States, but around the world. And the funds used here in Food for Peace are ones that I think are very important to us uh, as a matter of certainly humanitarian uh, issues, but also to the security of our, our country and its future. There are funds uh, designated within that Title II, some to be used for emergency aid and some to be used for developmental aid. Uh, and the difference being uh, the ability to respond to an immediate uh, crisis or disaster and other of the funds, the developmental aid, to be used to improve the chances that that crisis never occurs. I think the question that I want to raise with my colleagues here in the Senate is how do we allocate the, the, the amount between emergency food aid and the amount of money that we use to teach folks the skills necessary to help them survive when disaster strikes? We're not talking about any new spending, any new money. We're simply trying to address the issue of how do we allocate what uh, amount has already been decided upon by the committee. Uh, I uh, ha have been to Darfur, for example, uh, spent time in Sudan, and uh, saw the efforts uh, by many to keep people from starving, uh, and those are very important. I'm thankful for the generosity of Americans uh, both as charitable organizations and as taxpayers uh, who provide emergency food assistment, assistance to these people. And we never want to have the kind of suffering that we see there and other places around the world. But I'm concerned about the allocation that's included in this bill. Uh, and I've introduced this amendment to ensure that at least 20% of the Food for Peace, the Title II funds, are available each year for prevention-based programs that reduce hunger in poor, crisis-prone communities. If we can prevent the need for emergency food assistance and help more people gain the skills needed for their lifetime, then we should do that. And that's what this amendment is intended to do. The legislation we're considering significantly reduces the minimum amount of funding for developmental programs that equip vulnerable people around the world to feed themselves. The farm bill, this farm bill that we're debating reduces by nearly 40% the amount of funds that would be used for the important work of developmental aid and in, instead directs those dollars to emergency food aid. The amendment I'm offering would raise the minimum amount that would be spent on developmental programs by 5% so that we can prevent circumstances where people are starving and need that emergency aid. Uh, this has been an issue that uh, we have worked on uh, for a long period of time. I was uh, involved, this is my third farm bill as a member of Congress, and in the 2008 farm bill, uh, we created a lockbox, uh, an amendment that I offered that was included in the 2008 farm bill that set aside about $450 million for purposes of developmental aid, again, trying to make certain that we have the resources in place that reduce the chances that we're going to need emergency aid. Uh, it is true that many countries have high concentration of malnourished children, and subsistence farming usually goes hand in hand in those circumstances. Uh, affected by droughts and crop failures, eroding soils, and lack of sustainable income, these populations are short of food several months of the year, and they oftentimes need emergency food aid as a result. As a consequence of that, that circumstance, even though Title II emergency food aid programs are intended to be short-lived, lasting between just a few months, maybe up to a year, usually most emergency food aid is directed to the same areas year after year because the continuing need 
It's a reoccurring need, in fact. So year after year, we're trying to provide emergency food aid to the same populations in the same areas in the same countries. And my point is that we would be wiser in spending our dollars by trying to reduce the need of that reoccurring uh, starvation, that reoccurring need of lack of food. While the amount and length of a food crisis uh, and the need to stretch our taxpayer dollars as far as possible and using food aid more effectively is the key to success. The 2008 Farm Bill assured that a portion of that food aid would be combined with technical assistance, training and business development to boost agricultural productivity, conserve natural resources, link farmers to markets and improve child nutrition, incomes and diets. Uh, that lockbox set aside about $450 million, as I said. It's expected that if this bill was fully funded, that the, the millions is now uh, nearly $100 million less. And so we're moving in the direction of providing a lot less developmental aid. Uh, and in fact, when uh, in the 70s, when this program was, was amended and altered, 75% of Title II money, of Food for Peace money, was set aside for developmental aid. Over time, that amount has been reduced uh, time and time again. Through economic empowerment, improved infrastructure, watershed renovations, these programs in developmental aid help uh, protect and safeguard against the need for emergency aid. Providing a consistent and adequate level of funding for prevention-based programs has been proven to work. For example, in Haiti, World Vision has been implementing a five-year, multi-year assistance program supported by developmental aid funding. The Central Plateau region of Haiti has historically suffered from lack of adequate food, causing extremely high levels of poverty and stunting among children under ages uh, two uh, years of age. World Vision has worked with clinic and community health workers through a mobile clinic strategy to provide preventative nutritional and primary health care supported to mothers and children. And during their last national nutrition survey, large parts of that central plateau moved from red and yellow, the crisis areas, the severe food insecurity areas, to green, indicating the investment in preventing malnutrition using the non-emergency programs is an effective and worthwhile investment. And we continue to fight ongoing hunger by preventing additional use of the need for emergency funds down the road. So in Haiti, we see the example of using the prevention dollars to reduce the need for the disaster or crisis dollars. Title II prevention-based programs are implemented by private, voluntary organizations and, and, and co-ops. Uh, supported again by the American people and have regular audits and oversight. We're talking about organizations like World Vision, as I mentioned, Catholic Relief Services, Food for Hunger, Mercy Corps, uh, Congressional Hunger, uh, the United Methodist Committee. Uh, these are folks who are engaged day in, day out, year in, year out, in trying to prevent hunger from occurring or the, the circumstances which create hunger in a community from occurring. And the inability to plan and predict the uncertainty of the amount of money that would be available by what we do each year in appropriations and what we do every few years in a farm bill makes their job much more difficult. And so the consistency of having the, the resources available to fight uh, the, the need to fight the circumstances that create the need for uh, crisis uh, intervention is something that is important. The certainty that can come from knowing that there will always be this certain amount of money available for uh, prevention. Reasonable levels of food aid are important uh, in both the urgent needs. There's going to be crises, certain things that happen, a flood, natural disasters occur, and we know we need to be able to respond quickly uh, to, but we also know we need to be able to reduce the incident of hunger occurring time and time again in uh, certain areas of the world. With this amendment, Title III, I'm sorry, Title II was, will still largely be used for emergencies, but will increase by a modest amount the funding for developmental programs that help eliminate the need for that emergency assistance down the road. I would encourage uh, my colleagues in the Senate to support this amendment. I know this has been a significant uh, issue uh, within the uh, Senate Committee on Agriculture, and I appreciate their consideration uh, of uh, this topic. Uh, I would like to commend uh, the, the chairperson, uh, Senator Stabenow, and the ranking member, my colleague from Kansas, Senator Roberts, 
for their tremendous efforts in trying to bring to the United States Senate a farm bill that meets both the needs of agricultural producers and the people that they, that they feed. Uh, and so my uh, sincere appreciation to both those senators and other members of the Senate Agriculture Committee for their work, and particularly like to express my gratitude for the senator from Kansas, Senator Roberts, for his continuing um, involvement in agriculture throughout his time uh, as a member of the House, chairman of the House Agriculture Committee, now the ranking member of the Senate Agriculture Committee, and uh, his efforts uh, on behalf of the folks back home and as, as well as around the world are greatly appreciated by me. Again, I would ask uh, my colleagues in the Senate to support an adequate portion of the Food for Peace resources being used to stave off reoccurring food crises rather than just reacting to them. I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Alabama is recognized. Mr. President, as we deal with the uh, farm bill, we have to acknowledge that 80 percent of that bill now is food uh, program, the SNAP program, the food stamp program. I repeat that, 80 percent. So really we need to not call it the farm bill anymore. It really needs to be uh, considered primarily the food stamp program that it is. And when we look at the bill, our sponsors are rightly uh, pleased that they've tightened the belt of the farmers, they've reduced some of the subsidies and programs, uh, they've created a little better policy, I believe, and they deserve some credit for that. But of the 800 billion dollars that will be spent in the next 10 years according to current policy for food stamps, 800 billion compared to uh, uh, 200 billion uh, in the rest of the farm program, the 800 billion is only, they're only claiming a four billion dollar savings. So it is quite true that we in America do not want uh, to have people hungry, we do not want to have people malnourished, uh, but we want to run a food stamp program that has integrity, that create, creates an incentive for responsible personal behavior that helps America be a healthy nation. And I don't think we're there yet. In fact, uh, we've got members on the Democratic side who are opposing even this $4 billion dollar less than a half of 1% reduction in projected spending. They don't even want to have that. Cut the farmers, all right. Whack them 10%, 20%. Don't cut the, uh, anything else and deal with any other programs. So uh, our challenge simply is to make sure that people that are in need get it, but that we see this as a program for the most part that's temporary helping people through tough times and creating an incentive for them to move on and be successful and find work and uh, take care of themselves and their dependents. This chart, I believe, would give some indication of where we are. Uh, it's an accurate al illustration of the, the, the spending in this bill. We're talking about uh, the 2013 bill ne next year beginning October 1st of this year, we'll spend $82 billion for the food stamp program out of the legislation we're dealing with. Uh, $6 billion will go to conservation programs. That's not really a farmer's program. They may get some benefits from it. Uh, $6 billion for our commodities, the orange, and $8 billion for crop insurance, which is a new fundamental basis of farm policy. So I'm not complaining that farmers are being squeezed. Hopefully we've done this in a smart way that will make those programs better too. But what I'm suggesting to you is there's virtually no change in the 80 percent. And we don't have the money to waste if it can be done better and more smartly. 
right. So the main farm pr provisions in the bill experience a $14.7 billion reduction. That's a reduction of nearly 10%. Uh, if the food stamp proportion were to be reduced by 10%, it would save the United States Treasury $75 billion, for example. Food stamp spending has quadrupled since 2001. Uh, it doubled between 2001 and 2006. Some people say, well, the reason food stamps use is up is because of the unemployment and the recession. Well, that's not exactly so. Uh, for example, from 2001 to 2006, under President Bush's time, when the economy had a small recession but was uh, moving along very strongly in 2006, still it doubled from 2001 to 2006. Re unemployment remained at about 5% at that time. It's now 8. When food stamps were first expanded nationally, one in 50 Americans were on the program. Today, it's one in seven. Are we confident that all of those seven need this kind of subsidy? Are we really sure that's needed? I think we need to examine the program. If they need this benefit, let's get it for them. If not, well, let's, let's not. There are nearly 80 welfare programs in the United States government. 17 for food and nutrition support. 17 programs for food and nutrition support. Costs now exceed $700 billion annually for all these federal programs, food and others too, plus $200 billion in state contributions. So that's almost a trillion dollars a year, which is so much money it's difficult to uh, express it. An individual, for example, on food stamps may have a household whose total income may have a household that's eligible to be receiving and may receive $25,000 a year in total welfare support. We have a host of programs that, that people can qualify. So we need to keep that in mind uh, as we go forward. That is a patchwork quilt of federal, state pro programs that help people in need in, in addition to uh, charitable and religious support that people can access. Now the Farm Bill proposes to permanently elevate food stamps far above the pre-recession levels. In 2008, we spent less than $40 billion on food stamps. Over the next 10 years, 2008, just a few years ago, $40 billion a year, uh, food stamp spending over the next 10 years is estimated to average almost 80 billion, uh, a, a doubling that. This chart will show how we've grown from uh, a little under 20 billion in 2001, about 17 billion, uh, to uh, we'll go to in 2021 uh, uh, over 70 billion. You see a little decline there. That decline is a result of the projections from the Congressional Budget Office, and we hope they're correct, that unemployment will begin to drop in the future. So they're not showing that even though unemployment's now at 8% in 2011, they're not showing that you're going to have a major drop-off because unemployment is uh, falling. Hopefully it will be falling. Hopefully we'll get this economy on the right track. But the point I would suggest that's revealed in this chart and the projections is that unemployment is not the thing that's driving the food stamp increases. The increases far exceed the unemployment rate increases and the decline from a projected uh, reduction in unemployment is not very much either. Where food stamp total spending returned to pre-recession levels uh, those, say, in 2007, and then there were indexed for inflation increasing each year according to inflation, it would produce for the United States Treasury a $340 billion savings. So I don't think in 2007 uh, the numbers that were spent there uh, are disproportionate 
to what we would need today. And I believe properly managed, we could, we could do better. So the amendments I have filed, and there are four, address some of the perverse incentives for states uh, to have to increase food stamp registration rather than an incentive to increase the integrity of the program. For example, one of the things we need to do is to deal with the federal provision that provides bonuses to states who increase the number of people that are registered. States currently receive bonuses for increasing enrollment in the food stamp program. They don't get bonuses for efficiently managing the program. They don't get bonuses for finding people who are uh, on the program and on the program illegitimately, who are selling them on the marketplace or otherwise abusing the program. Now, they get bonuses for seeing how many people they can sign up. And that's, that's not a sound policy. Uh, the next amendment that I have uh, is restoring the asset test for food stamps. You would think that that's um, pretty well accepted, that if you have a certain amount of assets, uh, you shouldn't have the government to pay for your food if you have value and, and assets. So, but through a system known as categorical eligibility, 43 states, 43 states have now provide benefits to individuals whose assets exceed the statutory limit for them. Only 11 states did that in 2007. Why? A couple of reasons it appears. One of them is, I guess, they help get the incentive bonus to signing up more people. So if you change this asset test and get around the asset test and sign up more people, maybe you get a bonus. Number two, what incentive does a state have to reduce the amount of dollars from Washington? Not a dime of it do they match. What incentive do they have to uh, reduce the amount of money, free money in their mind, from Washington going to the state? Not much, really. So uh, this amendment, if passed, uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office, would uh, save $11 billion. And all it would do is to say that you have to comply with the requirements of the program before you get the food stamps. What the situation is that, uh, is that it's called categorical eligibility. If you qualify for any other program, the states have been given the power to say you qualify for food stamps, even though you don't meet the formal qualifications. But if you qualify for these others on the categorical eligibility, you're categorically uh, 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 entitled to food stamps. And so that's not a good policy. It's just not. It doesn't have the same standards, and we should fix that. Another thing is that there's what's been referred to as the LIHEAP uh, loophole. Uh, this reform and the amendment that I want to offer, and I have offered, and I hope we'll get a vote on it, it requires households that receive larger food stamp payments on the basis of home energy expense actually provide proof of that expense. And this is a real problem. States have been part of this, frankly. They've learned how to manipulate the low-income heating assistance program uh, monies, and it creates an opportunity to have more people qualify for food stamps. It's not good policy. It should not be continued. CBO says if that abuse were eliminated, it would save $9.5 billion over 10 years. And then uh, another amendment called M uh, the SAVE Amendment would simply require that the federal government use a program called SAVE, similar to the E-Verify program, to ensure, using the computer system, that those adults receiving benefits, adults receiving benefits, are in fact lawfully in the country. If you're not lawfully here, you should not be getting welfare support uh, from the United States government. How basic is that? You just should not. One of the most important things we can do 
to restore integrity in our immigration system is to quit providing economic benefits for people who violate the law. This is the first thing you do, and it's an important thing to do. And so I think that would be an amendment that we should, should uh, uh, in, uh, include. So according to the Congressional Budget Office, federal spending is set to increase 50% over the next 10 years. I repeat, federal spending is projected to increase 50% over the next 10 years. And this creates a problem for us. Our per-person debt is worse than that of Portugal, Greece, Spain, or Italy. This is a chart that shows that. These, uh, we didn't make these numbers up, and it's uh, uh, perfectly uh, established that they're uh, accurate. So the per capita debt of the United States per person, what does the United States government owe? $49,800 per person, man, woman, and child in America. Spain is 20000 Portugal 22, France 35, Greece 40, Italy 40, Ireland 46. Now, this is not a healthy thing for us. So the idea that we have unlimited ability to throw money at every problem we have and not make sure that every single dollar we appropriate to help people truly in need is wisely spent uh, is over. We've got to end that concept. This government, this Congress, this administration has been far too blasé about managing the people's money. It's like, well, we just want to leave the money out there and maybe it'll create a stimulus and somebody will help the economy and we'll give more uh, than we need and not worry about it and we don't want to investigate anybody. We don't want to cut anybody off. Uh, we, w that would sound like it's unkind. But it's not unkind to insist that people meet the qualifications of the programs and if people that don't meet the pro qualifications don't get the money. That's only common sense and that's justice as Americans know, uh, know about it. Amazingly, 40 cents of every dollar we're spending in our country today is borrowed. The United States is headed for what has been called the most predictable economic crisis in its history. The debt course we're on is unsustainable. We are headed to a debt crisis if we don't change where we're going, as every witness before the Budget Committee, of which I'm ranking member, has told us. Yet many senators in this body are not only unwilling to achieve even the $4 billion in savings on the $800 billion program, but some consider, and they consider the $4 billion too much to reduce from the program. We have a junior senator from New York proposes to increase food stamp spending even more than the current uh, growth that we've seen, explaining, quote, food stamps are an extraordinary investment because every dollar that you put into the SNAP program, the food stamp program, you get out $1.71, close quote. I won't repeat that because this is what the director of the program said, or the Secretary of Agriculture, I believe, he said that for every dollar spent on food stamps, you get out a dollar and 71 cents, close quote. Under this reasoning, we ought to just increase the food stamp program 10 times. Why not? We're going to get more money back. Somebody's going to create a stimulus, and it's going to bring in more money for the treasury and make the economy grow. Why don't we just pay for your clothes? Pay for your shoes. Pay for your housing. Why not? It's precisely this kind of thinking that has bled our treasury of money that we need to pay for the demands that this country has. I also think it's a moral issue. What is our policy objective? It is our national goal to place as many people. Is it our national goal to place as many people on welfare, food stamp support as we can possibly put on that program? Is that our goal? Is that a moral vision for the United States of America just to see how many people we can place in a situation where they're dependent on the federal government for their food? 
I just ask that. I think we should wrestle with that question. Under the current proposal, no fewer than one out of nine Americans will be on food stamps at any point during the next 10 years. Um, at least one out of nine will be on the program. What is the better goal? To permanently have one in nine Americans on food stamps? Or to have as many Americans as possible achieving financial independence? Left unattended, the safety net really can become a restraint, a trap. Welfare reform is guided by the moral principle that welfare support can become damaging not only to the Treasury of the United States, but to the recipient. Over time, the trillions of dollars we spend on welfare programs with the greatest of intentions, with the greatest desire to do good, can replace the normal support of family and private family, church, and community. It can become a, a barrier to self-sufficiency. It become an incentive uh, not to be engaged in the tough real world uh, of work and competition. So it's not compassion, I think, to increase without limit the size and reach of the federal government. The central premise of the American society is that the empowerment of the individual is always preferable to the empowerment of the state. Now, Mr. President, I understand that the amendments that I have, that we spent a lot of time working on, each one of them is crafted uh, to improve the program. None of them represent major cuts in the amount of spending that's involved in the food stamp program. E each one of them, and the biggest savings would be about $10 billion, but in each case, it's $10 billion that would be saved that would benefit uh, the efficiency of the program, the integrity of the program, and not reduce any of the benefits that would go to those who qualify for food stamps under existing law. It would not reduce that. But I'm concerned that the majority leader has filled the tree on this bill. Senator Reid has basically taken control of the amendment process. And so we have a bill moving through the Senate that, uh, that uh, will spend about a trillion dollars over the next uh, 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 10 years, that this bill will, uh, that 80 percent of the spending in this bill will deal with food nutrition programs, the SNAP program, 80 percent of it, and we've only had one amendment that deals with that program. Only one. And we've been here for days without voting on anything. Oh, the majority leader wants to approve your amendment. We want to be sure, and, and uh, uh, Senator Robinson is trying to get our amendments from the Republican side to be voted on, and the majority leader, well, I don't think I'll approve that one. I don't think that, I mean, no, we don't want to vote on that. We've already voted on something like that. We're not going to vote on that. You've already had a food stamp amendment. We're not going to have any more food stamp amendments. Now, that's the kind of talk that's going on here. But this is the United States Senate, the greatest deliberative body in the history of the world, something we are exceedingly proud of, that you can have debate, vast, continuous, intense debate. It's part of the glory of this body. And so now we have one person, the majority leader, using a parliamentary technique called filling the tree, is basically saying, I don't get a vote on any of those amendments I just mentioned. I believe they're responsible amendments. I believe all four should be adopted. I believe it would make the food stamp program better. It would help ensure we have enough money to make sure that the people who are in need get it. And if we don't get off the debt course we're on, we're going to be in a crisis, and all the programs are going to be cut, maybe more than we really need to cut them because we have got to get on the right course. So I'm, I'm objecting about this. I'm not happy about it. I don't think it's healthy. I do believe that the majority leader has utilized this technique of filling the tree uh, more than any majority leader in history, far more than any majority leader in history. And it's not a healthy trend for the, uh, the program. 
and we've always had a lot of amendments on the farm bill and we need to have these amendments so I hope and believe that I hope that we will get votes on this we'll be able to debate these amendments and we'll, we'll be able to help improve a food stamp program and I would want to make, mention one more thing Senator Rand Paul offered a bill an amendment earlier that, that did not pass that would have block granted the money to the states and I'm not sure I, I, I would I, you know, different people could disagree exactly how he would go about that and whether he did it the right way and the spending level that he chose was uh, appropriate but let me say this a system in which the federal government gives unlimited amount of money to the states and they pay it all and they pay all of it 100 percent creates a perverse incentive for the states to make sure that they achieve every possible dollar from Washington and creates no incentive for the state to, en to enhance the integrity of the program and to stop those who are abusing it. Because when you spend state money to investigate and prosecute and stop abuse, uh, you've reduced the treasury of the state. When you reduce the amount of food stamps pouring into the state, you reduce the amount of federal money coming into your state, an additional adverse consequence economically for that state. So we need to put a, create a situation which the state is given a certain amount of money, a, per, a formula, a fair formula, and then they have the responsibility of making sure it goes to the right people. And if, if, if four people aren't getting enough money, they'll then have an incentive to identify those who are improperly getting the money, cut them off, and direct the money to people in need. We don't have that incentive today. That's one reason the food stamp program is not operating effectively. So I think Senator Paul is, was correct fundamentally in his approach that block granting the, sta uh, the food stamp program to the state would create the right incentive to make the program more effective, uh, to create more integrity, and make sure that people most in need receive the benefits. I would thank the chair and would yield the floor. Mr. President. The Senator from Colorado. Th thank you, Mr. President. First, I'd like to thank the Senator from Alabama for calling this body's attention.